On this podcast, we go one step beyond publications and guidelines to speak directly with leading experts in interventional pulmonology. This podcast will address not only fundamental topics and exciting publications, but also unconventional topics for which the evidence base isn't that robust. The views expressed on this podcast are those of the speaker and not necessarily endorsed by the AABIP. This is your host, Dodit Chadda, an assistant professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And with that, let's dive into the next episode. Our topic for discussion today is medical thoracoscopy biopsy techniques. Our guest today is Dr. Sahajal Dhuria. Dr. Dhuria is an assistant professor in the Department of Pulmonary Medicine at the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research in Chandigarh, India. Dr. Dhuria has over 1,500 Google Scholar citations and some exciting publications on plural biopsy techniques, which will be the center of our discussion today. He has no conflicts of interest to disclose. As I got into my discussion with Dr. Doria, I realized that I could ask him a thousand questions. He's a wealth of knowledge. So without wasting much time, let me get into the start of our discussion. So Dr. Doria, can you please elaborate for us what are the theoretical benefits of using either the rigid or the semi-rigid thoracoscope? The greatest benefit with using the rigid thoracoscope is, is that it gives you a lot of maneuverability within the pleural cavity. So if you have lots of additions in the pleural cavity, the rigid scope with its greater tensile strength and the greater tensile strength of the rigid forceps, it helps you break the additions easily and quickly. It also gives you access to the different recesses of the pleural cavity. So if you are going very close to the diaphragm, from the same incision, you can really go up to the apical part of the pleural cavity. So whenever we have lots of additions. We are expecting additions uh, in a patient, especially those who have long-standing effusions because several patients presenting to our center have a history of symptoms and even documented effusions for about two to three months before they present to us. And several of them have already undergone pleural fluid aspirations, multiple aspirations that have been performed at different centers. So they tend to have more additions, more of thickened pleura when they come to us. So whenever we have such patients, we decide on a rigid thoracoscope for clearing the additions in a much better fashion. And not only it's about additionalysis, it's also about getting to the pleura uh, through those additions. So even a pleural biopsy can be can not be very successful if you are not clearing off all those additions, not mm-hmm. for a therapeutic purpose, but for a diagnostic purpose itself. And mm-hmm. the second thing is that sometimes we have patients who have already undergone a cytologic cytologic evaluation of their pleural fluid and there is detection of malignant cells in the fluid. But those cells cannot be further subtyped because the amount of tissue is less. So immunocytological analysis, immunophenotyping cannot be done in that kind of fluid. So there uh, we are called to do a pleural biopsy for getting a larger chunk of tissue. So in that case, we plan pleurodesis ahead of the procedure. So for performing pleurodesis also, we prefer the a rigid thoracoscope over the semi-rigid thoracoscope. The benefit with the semi-rigid thoracoscope is that the controls of the semi-rigid thoracoscope are very similar to the flexible bronchoscope. So uh, pulmonologists or interventional pulmonologists who are beginning their procedures, they usually begin with a flexible bronchoscopy. So once they shift to thoracoscopy, they have an easy time maneuvering uh, the uh, semi-rigid thoracoscope, which has the similar controls. So initially, the semi-rigid thoracoscope comes in very easy to maneuver. But when you start taking biopsies, then you realize that if you are used to the rigid thoracoscope, the performance of pleural biopsies is much easier because you straight away go with the rigid strong forceps and catch hold of the pleura and you get a good chunk of tissue. While performing biopsies with a semi-rigid thoracoscope is more difficult, especially with the fibrotic thickened pleura. Uh, So those are the pros and cons of each of the scopes. And before we started this recording, you told me something very interesting that the maneuverability is better with a rigid thoracoscope um, for people who are experienced. But for a novice, the flexible uh, or the the semi-rigid scope may be uh, easier to uh, maneuver. Yeah. Uh, Case to case, if I tell you, see, if you have a patient wherein you enter the pleura and you see that there are few additions or no additions, 
the pleura seems to be full of nodules. There is not much uh, like fibrotic thickening of the pleura. There, I think both the scopes are similar. The performance of the biopsy and the maneuverability are, are all similar. The problem arises whenever uh, the pleural cavity is full of adhesions. There it becomes difficult or the pleura is very thickened with fibrosis. There both the maneuverability and the performance of biopsies may be a little difficult with a submerged thoracoscope. Uh, it, is, it is rather more easy with the rigid thoracoscope. Case to case, they may be performing equally or differently. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so just to uh, clarify then again, uh, so your main ind indications for using the rigid thoracoscope are a desiolysis in terms to gain access, but in terms of the biopsy, you're using the rigid forceps just to get bigger tissues for certain diagnoses and certain conditions. Can you please enumerate for us as to what these conditions and diagnoses are that you are looking for uh, specifically with the rigid forceps? So uh, in our region, mesothelioma is not a big problem. Uh, we reported our series of about 350 patients in 2015, wherein uh, we reported a retrospective experience of closed pleural biopsies and medical thoracoscopic biopsies. And we had just two patients who were diagnosed with mesothelioma. So in regions where mesothelioma is a bigger problem, it gives you a real, really hard or uh, thickened pleura. So if you are planning uh, a thoracoscopy in such a patient where, where you are suspecting mesothelioma, it would be better that we go ahead with a rigid thoracoscope. In, uh, in patients who have long-standing effusions who come to us, who we are expecting that there, there will be adhesions inside. Also, sometimes in the CT, you can easily make out that the pleura is quite thickened. So in those cases, I would like to opt for the rigid thoracoscope over a mm -hmm. semi-rigid thoracoscope. At this point, I would like to refer our listeners to the RISE trial. The RISE trial was published by Dr. Turia in Respiratory Care in 2014. In this study, 90 patients were randomized to undergo thoracoscopy with either the rigid or the semi-rigid thoracoscope. There were 45 patients in each arm. Dr. Duria found that the diagnostic yield of rigid thoracoscopy was superior to semi-rigid thoracoscopy, 97.8% versus 73.3% but the diagnostic yield on an intention to biopsy analysis in patients who un successfully underwent biopsies, the diagnostic yield was similar for both, 100% versus 94.3%, and this difference was not statistically significant. Importantly, seven patients crossed over from the semi-rigid to the rigid arm due to adhesions. In the study to 32 and 49% of the patients in the rigid and semi-rigid arm respectively had a diagnosis of non-specific pleuritis. Dr. Duria's study had a follow-up period of six months and they followed up the patients with non-specific pleuritis for a variable period between six and 14 months. Here I must add that I found three other trials assessing this uh, similar question. A study on 80 patients by Verbs et al. in Germany found a slightly better yield with the rigid forceps. However, a 66% retrospective study in the UK by Khan et al. published in 2012 and an 84% randomized trial by Roseman et al. in 2013 had similar results to the intention to biopsy analysis by Dr. Duria. So let's discuss the coffee trial now. In this trial, 50 patients undergoing semi-rigid thoracoscopy were made to undergo either flexible forceps pleural biopsy uh, and cryobiopsy in an alternating fashion. The primary outcome, the overall diagnostic yield, was not different with the two tools, 78% with cryobiopsy and 76% with the flexible forceps. However, it must be said that the small sample size does not allow detection of a small difference that may exist between the two techniques. Now, there have been seven similar trials, all observational, four of them prospective, performed prior to your study, now cumulatively analyzing 364 patients. Um, only the 2018 study by Chen et al. from Taiwan showed a greater yield with cryobiopsies, 99 versus 91% with the flexible forceps. So what was your rationale to reinvent the wheel and perform your study again, uh, analyzing uh, cryobiopsies versus flexible biopsy? In other words, um, what theoretical benefits of cryobiopsy were you hoping would pan out um, in a study performed in a sort of randomized fashion. So when we looked at the trials or the studies reported on the uh, performance of cryobiopsy in the pleura, we saw that most of these studies reported a higher 
or a larger tissue size with the cryobiopsy as compared to the flexible thoracoscopic biopsies. So, because our yields are slightly lower than uh, th that reported in several of the studies, especially with the semi rigid thoracoscope, so, so we uh, wanted to see whether the introduction of this tool called the cryobiopsy offers any benefit in terms of increasing the diagnostic yield. Mm -hmm. So, what we were hoping was that with the larger tissue, we will be able to get a higher diagnostic yield with the cryobiopsy compared to the flexible pulsar biopsy. We also expected that because of the larger tissue, we can do away with fewer tissues as compared to the flexible forceps. So it will give us a quicker procedure using the cryo uh, cryo pro for performing the fluid biopsies. So those were the benefits that we thought. But what we uh, the results of the study were that the yield of uh, the two uh, tools were similar. But if you closely examine the trial, and we have also given a table wherein we have uh, given uh, the details of the patients in which the cryoprobe diagnosed certain disorders which were not picked up by the flexible forceps. And it's very important to note uh, those because we have uh, given a table of five such subjects and the diagnosis that were made on the cryoprobe biopsy were IgG4 related pleuritis, nocardiosis, mm -hmm. diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, metastatic melanoma and lung adenocarcinoma. So the yeah. first four diagnoses were, are really rare plural diagnosis and these were not picked up by the flexible forceps at all. Mm -hmm. Why cryoprobe failed to possibly achieve a higher diagnostic yield was because in four patients we were unable to perform the cryobiopsy itself. So uh, there okay. were multiple in both of these trials that we are discussing there were multiple operators. We are a teaching university hospital. We have several consultants who are performing these procedures and we also have third year fellows performing the procedures under our guidance. Mm -hmm. so, and multiple operators, it's a real world scenario. Most of the trials that have been reported have a single very experienced operator who performs the, uh, the study procedure. In, this, in both these trials, we had multiple operators performing this. So it was close to a real world scenario. So the point is that in four of these uh, patients, we had diagnosis that were very uh, rare diagnosis and these were not picked up by the flexible forceps at all. In one case, I would uh, uh, like to recollect that in the uh, patient that we diagnosed metastatic melanoma, there was no mm -hmm. skin lesion. We were not expecting anything like that. And the forces biopsy just picked up a kind of uh, malignant tissue in the in the pleural biopsy, but it, the pathologist could not make out what kind of malignancy it is. It was just malignancy NOS or a carcinoma, mm -hmm. not otherwise specified. So it was not suspected at all on the, that biopsy. But when she examined the plural uh, cryobiopsy. Then she realized that this, this might be a case of melanoma. So uh, that was only possible because the cryobiopsy gave us a greater chunk of tissue and deeper tissue. Mm -hmm. So the depth of the tissue reaching up to the extra plural fat or or deeper was about 65% of tissues in the cryo uh, to about 40% of tissue in the flexible mm -hmm. uh, biopsy. So if you are performing uh, biopsies in patients suspected to have mesothelioma where you require a greater depth of tissue, then also it may be useful. But when the pleura is very much thickened, sometimes the cryobiopsy, the cryoprobe may fail to really pull off a tissue because of the extremely thickened pleura and uh, because of the lesser tensile strength. In those cases, the flexible forceps biopsy also performs poorly, but there you have uh, this uh, way of taking biopsy that you can open and close the jaws of the forces multiple times at the same site at the pleura. So it slowly uh, put, uh, raises up a flap of the tissue which can be pulled off. Got it, got it. Yeah, I think this is very interesting. I mean, so two points you alluded to. One was the size of the tissue and it was seven millimeters with the cryoprobe on the median size versus four with the flexible forceps in your study. And... Uh, I mean, am I wrong in saying that I guess fibrotic thick pleura has less water content, so maybe freezing it is more difficult, yeah. and maybe Absolutely. that's why. Um, yeah, maybe that's why it's sometimes difficult. But very, very interesting points. And another interesting thing that I noticed in your study, and uh, caveat being, I have no experience with cryobiopsies in the pleural space, is that none of your patients had a bleed that was not controllable with just suctioning. So was this a finding uh, that you expected due to the coagulating effect of uh, the cold cryobiopsy? Uh, 
see we have been performing a lot of uh, cryo biopsies of the lung also that is the trans bronchial lung cryo biopsy for our patients with diffuse parenchymal lung disease mm -hmm. there we encounter a reasonable amount of bleeding and uh, the concept uh, one who is not performing the cryo biopsy may have this concept that the cryo will completely freeze the vessels there and there'll be no bleed but cryo biopsies of the lung bleed a lot they bleed a lot you need occlusion balloons to really mm -hmm. limit the bleeding to the segment but with a pleural biopsy i can't say really whether it really makes a difference between the uh, cryo probe or the flexible forceps arm but i noticed a slight bit of a difference that in the pleural space that uh, thing of coagulating the vessels and freezing out the vessels to reduce the bleeding works to some extent to some extent it works but i would not really uh, uh, try to amplify or magnify this uh, difference between the two even with the flexible forceps the incidence of uh, severe bleeding is not much it is right there in front of you even if it is there you can use uh, you can just wait it will most likely the blood will usually coagulate and you not require any tool to really stop the bleeding but if the ooze is much then you can use something like a cautery or uh, argon plasma coagulation to stop the mm -hmm. bleeding Perfect, so perfect. bleeding with the semi-rigid thoracoscope is not too much of an issue in most of the cases. It cannot be overemphasized that you cannot take a patient with uncorrected coagulopathy for your pleural biopsy procedures. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. That's a very, very good point. Um, okay, so let me take a slight diversion here and um, uh, and you know dive into your patient population a little bit. So in the coffee trial, 44% of your patients, and in the rice trial, 55% of the patients undergoing thoracoscopy and when thoracoscopy for suspected TB. Now, this is a very different population to what I see here in the US. Uh, mm -hmm. And an additional thing was in the uh, in the coffee trial, out of the 201 screen subjects, 151 were excluded. Now, I presume that, uh, you know, a large number of these were due to adhesions. And you mentioned that patients present late. So a lot of malignant effusions are complex and septated. Uh, but were a large chunk of these due to tuberculous effusions? Uh, see, the patients who have lots of adhesions in our population, uh, uh, there the differential is between tuberculosis as well as uh, incompletely managed paranemonic effusions. So mm -hmm. some patients, after performing a biopsy, we realize that it, it is just incompletely uh, managed paranemonic effusion. So patients who have pneumonia, they may go to a uh, smaller uh, medical setup, they may just receive antibiotics for a week or so. And sometimes they have a pandemonic effusion that uh, that is not picked up in the primary care facility. And then uh, it becomes an incompletely treated pandemonic effusion. That's why we had lots of non-specific pleuritis in our patient population who were not even tuberculosis. They were actually these uh, complicated pandemonic effusions which were which didn't, who didn't receive uh, the appropriate duration of antibiotic therapy. So one is that. Second is tuberculosis, which uh, causes a lot of uh, pleural adhesions. The third is that even malignant effusions, which are not mesothelioma, they may be just metastatic adenocarcinoma, also sometimes develop adhesions because of multiple pleural fluid aspirations that they mm -hmm. are subjected to uh, before they really present to our tertiary center. So these are the three uh, patient populations who present to us with uh, additions. Where uh, performing a rigid, uh, semi-rigid thoracoscopic pleural uh, biopsy may be a little difficult. Okay, fantastic. So this has been a very, very fascinating discussion. So to summarize, uh, with the wealth of experience and data in front of you, and you have now three different tools to biopsy, uh, yeah. could you tell us your current approach to selecting uh, let's say your rigid tool versus your cryobiopsy because these two will give you the largest tissue. Yeah. So uh, I would uh, like to uh, ask you to refer to our uh, paper that is a retrospective experience of plural biopsies in the Journal of Bronchology in 2015 mm -hmm. where we have given a sort of an algorithm uh, what we use for exudative plural effusion uh, in our uh, setting. So because of the high prevalence of tuberculosis, uh, in our setting, we always perform, apart from the usual uh, investigations of the pleural fluid, we also perform an uh, adenosine deaminase test for all our patients mm -hmm. and a pleural fluid expert MTB uh, rifampicin in all our patients. So if the expert is positive then we and the other clinical uh, picture is consistent with TB, we end up giving the patient 
antituberculosis treatment without doing any biopsy. If the ADA, that is the adenosine deaminase, is more than 70, and otherwise the patient fits into the classic picture of tuberculosis, a young patient coming with a one-month history of some bit of low-grade fever and uh, dragging chest pain, then we go ahead with ATT, antituberculosis treatment again for those patients. If the ADA is between 40 and 70, then we uh, take into account a lot of the clinical pictures. So, for example, if the ADA is 50 in a smoker who is 50 year old, we'll do a thoracoscopy. But if it ADA is 50 in a say again a young individual who has typical symptoms fitting up, fitting in with the diagnosis of tuberculosis fusion, we'll go ahead with empiric ATT itself. But if the ADA is less than 40, then we go ahead with a pleural biopsy, all cases irrespective of the clinical presentation. Now, once we have decided for a Plural biopsy. We have stopped performing uh, closed plural biopsies for about five to six years at our center. We have completely mm -hmm. shifted to medical thoracoscopy. But if, in some centers where medical thoracoscopy is not available and the primary differential is tuberculosis, they can still go ahead with a image guided closed plural biopsy because TB, as compared to a malignant plural effusion, has a better yield with closed plural biopsies because of the refuse involvement. Right. So mm -hmm. once we have decided a medical thoracoscopy, we will first do a chest ultrasonography. The chest ultrasonography shows additions or even the CT scan that has been, we perform uh, contrast and CT scans in all our patients planned for a medical thoracoscopy. Mm -hmm. so if the CT scan or the ultrasound shows a thickened pleura or septations uh, uh, panning the pleura from the lung to the uh, parietal part, then we decide to do a rigid thoracoscopy. Even if we are planning a pleurodesis ahead of the procedure, again, we'll adopt rigid thoracoscopy rather than semi-rigid thoracoscopy. But you can, uh, if your choice is semi-rigid, you can go ahead with a pleurodesis performed through a semi-rigid thoracoscopy. So once, uh, once there are no additions, uh, we can still take up rigid, but we can also opt for semi-rigid thoracoscopy in those cases. And uh, while performing semi-rigid thoracoscopy, you can use both the tools, cryoprobe as well as flexible uh, flexible uh, thoracoscopic biopsy. Because if you look at the coffee trial, we mm -hmm. have also said that the, uh, the yield with the flexible forceps was 76%. But if you combine the yields of both the probes, both the uh, biopsy techniques, then mm -hmm. the yield was 86%. So 86 versus 76. The difference was not statistically significant, but you can uh, imagine that if you are able to diagnose uh, uh, the cause of the pleural effusion in five more patients just by using another tool which you have in your bronchoscopy suite, then it's good. Even if it is not statistically significant, it will make a difference in a clinical setting. So the best is to combine the two tools. If you see clear, uh, clear nodules in front of you, which are not very thickened and you are able to take multiple tissue specimen with a flexible uh, biopsy forceps, that, that is sufficient. You may not need a cryoprobe there. But if you do not see any visible abnormality, you just see a thickened kind of pleura, no nodules. Then if you want a deeper tissue, then it's best that you combine both the modalities. Take three to four biopsy specimen with the cryoprobe and about five to six biopsy specimen with the flexible thoracoscopic biopsy. And then uh, we hope that you'll achieve almost uh, more than 90% diagnostic yield in any clinical setting. Fantastic. That That is a terrific summary of everything, uh, Dr. Doria. Thank you. So this has been a wonderful discussion, and I must congratulate you and your group for the wonderful research that you guys keep publishing. Um, I, would, again, I would like, I would, uh, yeah, sorry to sorry, interrupt, on, I would please. like to acknowledge my, uh, my other team members, including my mentor, Dr. Ritesh Agrawal, my head of the department, Dr. Ashutosh Agrawal, and we have an entire interventional pulmonology team with other of my colleagues who are performing these procedures, as well as uh, uh, collaborating to publish all our experiences and performing the trials. So I must congratulate all of you all, and I must say that I keep a keen eye for anything that you guys publish. It's always very exciting to read your papers. And again, thank you, Dr. Duria, for your time today, and I'm sure that the listeners will take with them several pearls of knowledge, just as I have. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. With that, we conclude an exciting episode here on the AABIP podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed hosting it. Do also check out our website, theippodcast.com, and please do provide us with feedback and suggestions on what topic and which expert you want to hear next. Until next time, take care.